So again, welcome. Today's topic is racial justice and the climate movement. And um, this is what part of our Wednesday webinar series here at EPIP. My name is Biz Gormley. I'm at EPIP headquarters in New York City. And we're joined today by four wonderful presenters, Elizabeth Yampier, Farhad Ibrahimi, Samantha Harvey, and Bernard Williams. So thank you guys for joining us. If you're on the call live, you can see us on the webcams. And if you are calling in on the phone or watching the recording afterwards, um, we will be not visible to you, but hopefully you will get everything you need from the slide content. So first, uh, just a quick overview of what EPIP is. Um, Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy is a national network of foundation professionals social entrepreneurs, and other change makers who strive for excellence in the practice of philanthropy. And our mission is to develop emerging leaders committed to building a just, equitable, and sustainable society. We are a national network of um, regional chapters in 14 different cities and over 1,200 members. And we provide a platform for our community to connect with others, to learn and practice your leadership skills, and to inspire emerging ideas in the social sector. Um, we have an explicit commitment to social and racial justice, so we're particularly excited about today's topic. And if you are new to EPIP or if you're hearing about us for the first time or maybe coming back and interested to learn more, please reach out with any questions or to learn more about membership. Um, my email is on the screen. It's biz at epip.org. I know some of you are part of um, member organizations, but you're on your first EPIP webinar, so welcome to anyone who is a new EPIP um, member. And if you would like to learn more about what that means, please reach out. I would love to talk about it. So looking ahead to um, future events with EPIP, we have our next webinars. We actually have a special edition one next week. Um, with Change Philanthropy, and Change Philanthropy is formerly known as the Joint Affinity Groups. It was founded in 1993 to unify identity-focused philanthropic affinity groups, and now it's an empowered coalition of seven member organizations and a variety of ally organizations. Um, the webinar is going to be a chance to get to know a little bit more about Change Philanthropy, the movement, and the organization. It's going to be led by the coalition catalyst Carly Hare, who's the head of Change Philanthropy. And she's going to introduce the fresh mission and vision, focus areas, and preview the tools and resources that um, Change is making available to all of us on their website when they launch in August. So please join us for that webinar. It's going to be a great opportunity um, for you and hopefully your organizations to join that effort. It's on August 3rd at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And then we also have an EPIP conference preview coming up on August 10th. That's also at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, and it's going to be a chance to get to know our planning committee, the members who have helped bring the conference together, as well as learn more about the content. We're going to be announcing workshops, digging into the who and what the plenaries are going to be about, um, some of the special events and opportunities to connect with Baltimore and where we'll be. So we hope you'll join us on that webinar as well. You can register for all of our events on epip.org slash events. And if you have any questions, again, biz at epip.org. Um, our annual conference is in September from the 13th to the 15th. And we would love to welcome any and all of you to join us. Registration is open. Um, the hotel booking is still open, actually. So check out the link here. It's epip.org slash 2016 underscore nationals underscore conference. And let me know if you have questions. And then also EGA has a fall retreat that we wanted to help um, shine some light on. So if you're interested in joining for the EGA fall retreat, it's September 15 to 18. Um, Jackson Lake Lodge in Moran, Wisconsin. So it's part of the Grand Teton National Park. Sounds like a beautiful event to be part of. Um, reach out to EGA if you have any questions about that. So focusing in on today's event, <clears throat> I just want to give a couple of quick housekeeping tips. First, if you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to write them into the question box on your control panel. That'll allow us to help you troubleshoot. If you have comments or content questions that come up for you throughout the presentation, please also put them in that question box. Um, we are going to have a moderated question and answer portion at the end of the presentation. And um, any questions that you have, like I said, as they come up, we don't want to lose track of them. So please feel free to drop them in there and then 
We'll get back to them at the question and answer portion. We are going to be running a poll in just a second to get a sense who's on the line. Um, that poll and our question portion will be anonymous, so please feel free to speak freely. You can use the hashtag EPIP webinar to follow the conversation online. Um, and this, this webinar is going to be recorded, so it will be on our archive on the EPIP website. Um, and just so you know, it is live and recorded. And then finally, when the call ends, or rather when the webinar ends, it will prompt you for a survey. It's a few questions. It really helps us to make sure that we're providing content that's relevant and interesting to you guys. Um, if you have ideas of things you'd like to see but haven't, please let us know. I appreciate it if you can just take a moment to fill that out. Thanks. So without further ado, I'm really excited to welcome our speakers. Um, you'll see on the screen the variety of places they work and are dedicated to leading. Um, we are really lucky to have people calling in from all over the country to join us and share some really important insights. So uh, please feel free to read their bios on our website. We would love to have you dig in, learn more about them. Hopefully they'll provide information as to how you can follow up with each of them. Um, but please help me welcome Elizabeth, Farhad, Samantha, and Bernard to the EPIP uh, webinar platform. And thank you to EGA for co-sponsoring this awesome event. Um, before we turn into uh, Elizabeth to start us off, I'm going to ask uh, for each of you who's on the line to please just give us a sense of what kind of work you're doing. So you'll see the poll has just popped up and asked what best describes your employer. If you could please choose which of those is a better match for you. We'd love to know kind of what types of organizations are represented today on the call. All right, I'm going to leave it open for about five more seconds. If anyone hasn't voted, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Great. So it looks like we're about 54% foundation representatives today, 25% uh, calling in from nonprofits, 13% from other types of organizations. You can feel free to write in the question box if that is a place you'd like to describe what other means for you, 2% um, from social enterprises, and 7% from philanthropic advisory firms. Thank you all for joining. So Elizabeth, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to pop up your slides now, and we'd love to hear. Um, we'd love to have have you take it away. Thank you so much. I, I really am really grateful. Well, uh, one of the everyone, um, really grateful to EBIP and to this panel for uh, putting this together. This is really uh, the conversation that is being had all over the country. It's central. To all of our decision making, we literally are existing at the intersection of racial injustice and climate change, and much of our work um, really is challenged uh, by both of those things. So, so I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uprose and then uh, about some of the things that we're doing to address uh, this crisis, um, and some opportunities that I think um, I'd like to share with you in terms of how you can be part of this conversation and you can move uh, what I think is uh, the most necessary agenda along to address um, the issues that, that exist right now, not only in our communities but in this country. Um, my organization is Uprose and it's Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. Um, it's an intergenerational, multi-ethnic, multiracial organization that has been working um, in the community of Sunset Park for 50 years this year. Uh, I've been there since 1996, uh, 20 years, and since I came, we've been working, we've been dedicated to environmental and social justice. Um, I come and I, I was born and raised uh, in an environmental justice community. Uh, and I live in an environmental justice community, and so a lot of these issues uh, that we're working on are quite personal. The climate justice movement comes out of the environmental justice community, and the environmental justice movement comes out of the civil rights movement. So intersectionality has been uh, part of our work for many years. Um, in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, our organization has um, just, um, in the past 20 years, doubled the amount of open space. We've planted hundreds of trees. We stopped the siting of a 520 megawatt power plant that would have been the size of three football fields. 
We've expanded a median on a very busy corridor to make the community more pedestrian friendly. We were able to get back a bus line for our elders when MTA uh, had their bus line on the chopping block. We sent three young people to an article on scientific expeditions, young people from the neighborhood, uh, one to the South Pole. Um, we hold the largest gathering of young people of color on climate change in the country. Up to 750 young people come to learn about climate change and what they can do in their community. And one of the reasons we do it is that we feel that young people of color have really been left out of the climate change conversation. Um, and we think that it's important for them to see uh, people of color in positions of leadership on board of directors, as executive directors, um, as policymakers, that um, we can't have our young people either be poster children to another agenda or not seeing themselves in positions of power. That a lot of what they learn, they learn by watching and absorbing. Um, and so when gatherings are held and the leadership doesn't look like people from the community, um, they they really internalize that. And so um, they've been left out in college, they've been left out in huge national leadership conversations, and so this was our attempt to make sure that they were at the table in our training, which we hold every year. It's called At the Table Youth Leadership, and um, we have one going on right now as I speak, and we've got about 30 young people who are out organizing uh, to address climate justice. So these are some of the things that we did uh, not because we were environmentalists, but because our people couldn't breathe. They were suffering from asthma, upper respiratory disease, living in cancer clusters, living in the midst of environmental burdens. You know, many times one of the things we've said for years is that our communities are the unreluctant, are, are the reluctant hosts uh, to, the, uh, to the infrastructure that exists in our communities. We started out working on environmental justice and we moved towards uh, being solution oriented and trying to make sure that the infrastructure uh, would be a solution solver. And so right now, uh, one of the things that we're doing is we are work, Sunset Park is located in New York City's um, largest significant maritime industrial area. And that industrial area is being commercialized. Um, and it's a real problem in New York City. I use New York City as an example nationally because our industrial sectors are uh, really losing the manufacturing jobs and they're losing the opportunity to build for climate adaptation. What's happening not only in New York but in Detroit and California, everywhere where people of color have basically uh, made their living and are part of a working class community um, is that these industrial sectors have become commercialized and become sort of um, this playground for the privilege. So maybe it, it, in, in Sunset Park, it's becoming like they, like Williamsburg and like Chelsea and like Dumbo. Um, and what these industrial sectors do, if you look at the next slide, is it really provides us with a vehicle for building for climate adaptation and resilience for building blue collar jobs that pay three times as much as, as commercial jobs. Uh, places where instead of assembling parts for offshore wind, we could have a an industrial manufacturing hub for for offshore wind. Um, we uh, up Rosen Sunset Park is looking at and very close to operationalize one of, operationalizing one of the first big uh, community-owned solar uh, initiatives in New York City and maybe possibly in the country. Um, so these are the things that we do. We not just fight against the siting of environmental burdens and discriminatory siting policies, but we're working towards operationalizing just transition. So all of that is central to our work. A few years ago, before uh, we started to organize for the People's Climate March, we were part of the founding of an initiative which Samantha is going to talk about called the B, Building Equity and Alignment for Impact. And the idea behind that uh, is that given the size of the urgency and the size of, the, of climate change, uh, that we would start um, working on building alignment between big green grassroots organizations like mine and funders. That we understand that in order to be able to even address this problem and for the front line to sustain meaningful engagement over time, that resources would have to be allocated in a way that was more, uh, that, that was more just. Um, we know, for example, that um, given the amount of resources that grassroots organizations have, that per dollar, our accomplishments often exceed what is what 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 larger organizations actually have in terms of outcomes. 
So, so this conversation is really important because what's happening in grassroots communities or in, in community organizations that are that are led uh, by grassroots organizations is that uh, not only are we building um, leadership on the ground uh, that understands the intersection of these issues, but we also are operationalizing solutions that are really making a difference in our community. Um, our community, for example, uh, was at a rally uh, on police misconduct last week, and then this week uh, at a rally because of displacement, um, and this afternoon working on a block-to-block -block organizing effort to teach our community about um, about climate change. Um, one of the things that often happens in our community is that you get um, these big organizations that really sort of helicopter in uh, and not only want to speak for our community but want to find out what we think and what we're doing so that they can actually supplant local leadership. This conversation is important because of that continues to happen as it has for many years where funders often think about success in terms of the size of the budget and not the size of the impact of an organization and prefer to put their funding and support behind larger organizations than those that are grassroots-led organizations or organizations led by people of color. What you're going to have is a nation that is majority made up of our people, uh, people that are that are the least responsible for creating climate change, but are the ones that are going to be most impacted, and they're going to be disengaged. Our communities need to be as excited and as involved in the climate justice movement as people before us were about the civil rights movement. And so this really um, is something that challenges how we plan not only to build just relationships in, ju in a just society, but how we're willing to allocate resources to really address the challenges being faced by frontline communities and support the creative, innovative, cutting edge work that we're doing. So anyway, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, Bernard, I'm gonna pass the uh, presentation over to you. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Can we see my screen? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for, for what you just shared. Um, and I think I will uh, show a, a, another side that can help us um, in terms of listening to what Elizabeth has just shared. Uh, we're on this, all on this call because we want to create an unstoppable climate movement that is just and inclusive. And I'm here today as an African-American ally that has always cared about the health of our planet. Um, but in my eight years of working in the environmental field, I perceive that green organizations and funders focus more on the planet than the people who inhabit it. And these experiences have frustrated me to points where I've considered removing myself from the climate fight altogether. And unfortunately, my story isn't unique. Uh, you see, every day people of color and other historically less privileged groups must perform triage on how they will overcome systemic oppression. And so today what I'm going to do is show how committing to an institutional transformation will increase the relevancy and the impact of the climate fight, freeing us to uh, create the unstoppable climate movement we all seek. So a key takeaway is going to be that internal equity work is essential for organizations and funders to effectively deliver on a message uh, mission for social change. And let me explain why an internal approach is vital. You see, climate change, as Elizabeth has shared, is a justice issue. Those least responsible suffer the most from the causes and impacts. 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal plant. Our asthma is the top reason why students miss school. Low-income communities have fewer resources to adapt to a changing climate, and this is on top of the other systemic issues, uh, like African Americans, for example, represent 26% of juvenile arrests, yet 58% of state uh, prison uh, admissions. So an inclusive intersectional approach is necessary for an effective movement. First, it increases the relevancy uh, of the movement. It shows that we actually care about people, which in turn invites frontline leadership and power and allows for stronger solutions that benefit all. But we must change ourselves to create the safe space for an intersectional approach. 
uh, to authentically and effectively build an inclusive movement, funders and organizations must do the internal equity and inclusion work ourselves. We must be the change ourselves. And let me talk about what I mean by showing our background at ACE. At ACE, we're, uh, our name is the Alliance for Climate Education. We're a nonprofit founded in 2008, and our mission is to educate young people on the science of climate change and empower them to take action. We run programs in five cities nationwide, and we focus specifically on high school age young people. And thankfully, we've evolved for the better, and let me explain how. Our goal is to educate as many high school students as possible on, our goal initially was to educate as many high school students as, pop, as possible on climate science and solutions. And our award-winning assembly has reached more than two million students uh, nationwide. But in retrospect, we realized that we had um, some warts, and one of them is that our internal leadership team did not represent the communities we serve. There were no people of color on the executive team or board of directors. We observed higher rates of turnover for staff identifying as people of color, and we received exit interview input that voices of our POC staff were not being heard. So with that, we had the mindset of really bringing attention to the justice aspects of how things are in ACE and outside of ACE. And with that, it brought tension to the organization. Starting this work wasn't easy. Some staff worried that a new focus on justice might make us lose our niche as a science-based organization. Some executive leadership feared that a new focus on justice might raise internal tensions, uh, create a loss in productivity, confuse our funders, and uh, commit us to an unsolvable problem. I mean, we're going to tackle race and climate change. Good goodness. Um, but we ended up going from tension to progress because we overcame these internal fears by proceeding thoughtfully and seeking external support. And here are some of the keys to our success. We ended up working out, working with partner organizations for support, great organizations like Fierce Allies and the International Multicultural Institute. With Fierce Allies in particular, uh, with the uh, leadership of Jamie Akota Taylor, they allowed us to assess ACE's history, strengths, and weaknesses to understand our um, to, to understand our starting point. They allowed us to build trust among our staff through workshops and thoughtful discussions, and also to create a structure for full staff to engage in learning and strategy. Now, with this, we were able to see many tangible benefits. One, we developed stronger programs and a stronger mission. We lost, launched the ACE Action Fellowship, which is a year-long hands-on advocacy training for youth. We also became more effective at helping you bring a justice frame into local and national climate action. Now, with this, it enhanced our ability to ally with justice organizations. We partnered with grassroots organizations in each region of our fellowship. We also created an equity lens to guide all ACE decisions, and we formed a justice team to safeguard equity and inclusivity at ACE. On top of that, we created internal equity and inclusion growth and goals. For example, training for new hires, ongoing learning for all staff, and goals for each department with our HR development and our programs as examples. Now, we also see, have seen some tangible benefits with our actual program. A recent evaluation of our Action Fellowship with Circle, a project of Tufts University, found that the Action Fellowship gives leadership skills to youth of color. So despite entering the fellowship with significantly lower self-ratings than white students, young people of color reported greater improvement in public speaking and petitioning. So for example, we saw a 25% improvement in public speaking skills reported by students of color, whereas white students reported a 5% increase. Likewise, we saw a 27% improvement in petitioning skills reported by students of color, whereas white students reported a 5% increase. And the picture that you're looking at right now is one of, of one of our fellows, Victoria Barrett. Now, here are some of the intangible benefits of the justice focus that we've uh, grown from. Number one, we have a stronger internal culture. We earn greater trust internally, increased feedback from historically less privileged age staff, and we gained a better understanding of the value of sharing viewpoints. We learned that every discussion doesn't have to be turned into an action. A lot of times the work is the discussion. Additionally, we learned to have a greater appreciation for youth feedback, to respect our youth more as experts and implement their ideas to evolve our program. We've also enhanced 
have enhanced knowledge of organizational self. We know now that we're not a big green, but we're also not front line, that we're at the intersection and we bridge organizations and intersections. So let me tell you how funders have helped us at ACE get to this point. Funders have validated our investment in internal capacity building. They provided us restricted funding for training, workshops, and staff time to build a vision and strategy for race and justice. They supported using equity and diversity as a lens to improve ACE programs to be more relevant and helpful to young people of color. They also mandated a focus on board development. They pushed ACE, pushed us to develop our board leadership to be more diverse and reflect the communities we serve. Finally, we received great overall advice and feedback from foundations such as the Overbrook Foundation, the Smith Reynolds Foundation, the Rose Foundation for Communities and the Environment, and many others. So with this, I would like to leave some recommendations that I have for funders to actually uh, do even deeper work and, and to uh, further the climate justice uh, work. Number one would be to make justice either a priority or a greater priority with your foundations. Fund traditional environmental justice or grassroots organizations and climate organizations with budgets of less than $3 million annually. Push the big greens and the in-betweens like ACE to think critically about how justice and equity interact with programs, partnerships, and organizational culture. Also, ask questions that support hard internal work. Ask, for example, why is justice important to grantees? How are grantees adding value to an intersectional climate movement? Ask also how grantees, ask grantees to set goals for justice, equity, and diversity, and require an annual report on progress. And finally, be the change. Do the internal work yourself. Uh, what would it take, for example, to shift your organizational culture to align with an organization like Uprose? Ask and listen for grassroots perspectives and show that this influences your funding strategy. If we apply these recommendations, uh, to make justice a priority, to ask questions that support hard internal learning, and to be the change, to do the internal work ourselves, uh, we'll take a giant leap toward creating the unstoppable climate movement that is just and inclusive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bernard. I'm going to turn the mic over to Farha. Hi, y'all. And can everybody see my screen right now? Yes, we can. All right, excellent. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Farhad Ibrahimi, and I've worked with a foundation called Chorus for the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, our mission statement is to support a just transition to a regenerative economy in the United States. Um, and to do that, we support communities on the front lines of the old extractive economy to build new bases of political, cultural, and economic power for systemic change. And what I'm about to walk you through right now is a sort of, whoops, is a bad slideshow thing that didn't go right. So bear with me for a moment as I bring that back up. There we go. Um, this is an adaptation of a piece I wrote last year called What We've Learned After a Decade of Climate Funding and What We're Doing Instead. And in the interest of time, I'm going to spend a little bit less talking about what we saw 10 years ago in our peers in uh, philanthropy who were engaging on climate and talk more about what we've learned over the last 10 years. And so there's three main lessons uh, which I've just put up. And they may seem sort of obvious, but I'm going to talk through what I think their implications are both for the kinds of strategies we look to support as well as what it means for how we support them as philanthropists. So, Large-scale social change requires social movements. This is how we've seen things play out in the past. We know that the climate crisis requires large-scale social change, and we know some things about social movements. Uh, mo social movements are about power and political will, outside strategies. They're led by those on the front lines of crisis, which in the case of the, of the climate crisis is people of color and low-income folks. Uh, and finally, uh, social movements aren't lists of organizations or campaigns. Uh, any more than an ecosystem is like a list of animals or flowers or something like that. It's actually the relationships and the shared narrative that really makes something a movement um, and that political and ideological alignment is a big part of that. Uh, so the second thing that we learned is, again, seems kind of obvious, systemic problems require systemic solutions. But the way we've seen this play out with climate is really the need to acknowledge that 
it is an ecological crisis that is inextricably connected to related crises in our economy and our democracy. And to make a progress on any one of these, we must also address the other two, that it's not just an issue of an ecology, it's not even just an issue of our energy systems, but we have to be talking about economy, we have to be talking about democracy, and we need to have a lens around race, class, gender, sexuality, et cetera, when we do so. Uh, and then the third thing that we learned is that place is where these things really come together, that specific communities, specific places are on the front lines of crisis, and if we're approaching things with a social movement orientation, that's where we need to focus our efforts. And that also that the inextricable nature of these crises is clear at the community level. Uh, I've seen that with our work in Appalachia and how mountaintop removal coal mining is deeply connected to the prison industrial complex because of the way the economic development narrative plays out. Uh, we've heard just a little bit about that now from, from Elizabeth in terms of how their climate justice work also connects to work around gentrification in terms of what's happening with, in Sunset Park. So with these three learnings in mind, we really set forward to, to try to identify from our perspective in philanthropy what does a place-based social movement strategy for systemic change look like and how should we be supporting it? And so one thing that we've been really impressed by is this movement around a just transition framework. But I want to make a little bit of a clarification, which is, is not a framework that was developed by funders just because we're a big advocate for it at Chorus. It's actually something that we've learned from a lot of folks. I want to just run through a quick list uh, of the folks that we learned it from, who are among the many folks out there working with it, like Kentuckians for the Commonwealth in Kentucky, the Climate Justice Alliance Network at a national level, uh, Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project in the Bay Area, who's done tremendous work around political education and training, uh, the Just Transition Alliance, Labor Network for Sustainability, uh, Uprose with Elizabeth on the phone here, and many others. Uh, and also just acknowledge the, the concept of just transitions roots in the labor movement and the work of Tony Mizaki from the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers International Union. That I want to make sure we name this because I think there's a tendency in philanthropy to take ideas that we didn't actually develop and champion them without mentioning who we learned them from. But to move on to what we're talking about, when we say just transition, for me one of the most resonant and simple ways of framing it is that transition is inevitable, justice is not. And that when we're faced with a crisis like the climate crisis, it's clear that we have to do something. Something will change. We can't keep continuing the way we've been going. But it is not necessarily going to be a just response. And in fact, we've seen that a lot of proposed solutions to the climate crisis are actually false solutions that would simply exacerbate issues of enclosure, privatization, and further wealth extraction. Uh, which is to say, to make a really clear point of it, a clean energy transition is not necessarily a just one. And if you're getting thrown under a bus, it doesn't matter if the bus is electric or not. So it's not just where we're going, but how we're all getting there. And this is not just consumers, but also the communities that live near the infrastructure, the folks that work in the fossil fuel installations, everybody who's part of the economy that currently depends on fossil fuels and needs to transition to something else, we need to all be looking out for each other. It can't just be a change of infrastructure that throws some folks under the bus. Um, so this approach to just transition, for us, checks the boxes in terms of what we had learned. First, it's frontline communities determining their own future in relationship with each other by building collective power from the bottom up. That's a social movement orientation. Second, it demands systemic change. And just to be clear, when we talk about just transition, we're talking about a just transition to a new political economy, not just a just transition to more jobs in the existing economy. And finally, it's place-based. It's about how the transitions for specific places can be handled in a way that's timely and just, and it's grounded in the experience of those most familiar with those places, the folks that live there. So what are the implications for philanthropy, both of this just transition strategy and of the three things that we've learned over the last 10 years? As you might expect, the implications are pretty straightforward. We should be supporting social movements, we should be supporting systemic change, and we should be supporting places. But what does that actually mean? In terms of supporting social movements, I think it's a relatively easy answer for philanthropy. We should be supporting the grassroots organizing sector, we should be supporting movement-oriented organizations, and specifically we need to be supporting communities of color, low-income communities, etc. Supporting systemic change is a little bit more complicated, so I'm going to come back to that one in a moment, but supporting specific places Again, that's fairly straightforward. We should be supporting place-based organizations in communities of color, in low-income communities, the organizations in the communities that are on the front lines. 
But so what does it mean to support systemic change? It's not just what we support, it's how we support it. And I want to name that funders are often the biggest obstacle to transformational work, that even when we are supporting, quote, the right organizations in the right places, that we are still not allowing them to do the right kind of work that they know that they need to do. I think that there's a tendency in philanthropy to come up with solutions, come up with what we think needs to be happened, and then figure out who we can fund to do it. My belief and our belief at Chorus is that we should be supporting movement organizations to do what they know needs to be done in their communities, and that that would be the right way to approach it. And thinking about that a little bit makes it a bit clearer what supporting systemic change can look like. And, it, and these are not complicated ideas, general operating support. Restricted grants tend to constrain complex systems to a single issue or approach. If we're really going to be supporting folks to think big, think systemically, we cannot restrict our grants such that we only allow them to work on one of the many intersecting circles. And long-term grants, short-term grants tend to abandon the transformational to satisfy a transactional pipeline, timeline. And a truly just transition, I think we can all see from the complexity of the systems we have to deal with, will require long-term work. This requires long-term commitments from the philanthropic community as well. This is not to say that these two are a silver bullet, but I think that these two strategies, very basic, philanthropy 101, we're not doing nearly enough of them, and thus a lot of the power is being held with philanthropy instead of being given to the groups on the ground to do the work that they need to do. So just to talk a little bit about what this can look like in practice for the Chorus Foundation, we have long-term commitments to four communities in the United States, Alaska at a state level, Buffalo, New York at a city level, Kentucky at a state level, and Richmond, California at a city level. And for each of those four communities, we fund between 500,000 to a million per year per community. It's general operating support for the anchor organizations that we work with in those communities for the entirety of the life of the foundation. So we're a spend out foundation. We'll only be around for eight years. And thus, when we work with folks that are the anchors that we really work with in these communities, we give them eight year grants. They know we are in it to win it with them for the long term as long as we're going to be around. And it's gen op support, of course, so they can do whatever they need to do. That means every year our, our conversations with them can be much more useful than just how did your work go? Are we going to re-up you for a grant? And can instead be what else can we do to be helpful? Are there folks that we can introduce you to? Can we host a convening? Should we be giving you a landscape of what we're seeing in other communities so that you can get a sense of spaces that you may not have access to? That's all a really important role we can play, which to my eye is much more important than being in this sort of annual or every couple of years like a valuatory role that might not be what the groups need. Um, and in each of these four communities, we have a grant making process beyond the anchor organizations to fund the ecosystem around them, trying to think about what we know about social movements. And in all of this, it should be needless to say, but given the communities we've, we've selected to work in and the crises that they're focusing on, we're funding groups that are led by people of color, low income folks that organize in those communities as well, because that's the frontline leadership that we need to be supporting. Um, this all adds up to be a little over two-thirds of our grant making budget and the remaining one-third is mostly about networks and movement support organizations that work with these communities. So even the national organizations we're supporting, whether they're a network or they do training or they run a conference, they are you know, networks, conveners, trainers that are relevant to these specific place organizations, place-based organizations that we support. So even at the national level, our lens is always about place-based work and how we can be supportive of it. Um, this is, again, this is all in the context of spending down. We believe that given the climate crisis, it's more important for us to move our grant making now. And also spending down gives us the clarity needed to make these long-term commitments. Um, I have just a couple of takeaways that I'd share about this process because I think one of the things that we don't do enough of in philanthropy is talk about what we could have done better. So we feel very good that we make these long-term commitments to these communities. We feel very good that we're involving local leadership and the grant making for the larger ecosystem. Um, but we could have done a better job with the process. And a couple things I'll mention really quick is we started with a competitive RFP to identify three of these communities. and. We didn't have a lot of experience with competitive RFPs, and one of the reasons is I think that they, they, by definition, set you up for a challenging situation. You're going to see more wonderful work than you can possibly support, and you need to be mindful about what you ask people to go through to introduce themselves to you if you know you're not going to be able to support all of them. And I think we learned that 
you know, we could have been much more transparent about the process than we should have been. We thought we were doing better than most, but we still had plenty of room for improvement. Funders hold power in many ways. Access to information is one of them. Um, and also the process wasn't the best fit for every community. And without a larger sense of what other grant making could look like, what the opportunities are for smaller, shorter grants, et cetera, it can look like this is an opportunity to get well resourced for eight years, which seems great, but what about the folks who aren't ready for that? What about the folks who aren't in the right geographies for that, et cetera? And I think we did not do as much thinking as we could have done in terms of ways that this grant making process could have been uh, connected to other grant making processes. And this is a transition to my last point, which is it's not just about what else we do as a foundation, it's about how we connect to other funders. And we have just had reinforced for us a number of times over the last 10 years the importance of funder organizing, not just going to conferences and doing webinars and things like that, but getting real about building relationships, alignment, and collaborating really deeply. So I'm excited to talk to any of you all who are interested in talking about this. My contact information is on this last slide below. It's far out at chorusfoundation.org. And I just want to thank everybody. It's been a real honor to, to be on this panel today. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to turn um, the mic over to Samantha who has a few comments and then we'll jump into questions. So if folks want to start typing questions into the box, that would be great. And Samantha, if you want to take it. Sorry, I'm just making myself the presenter. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth Bernard and Farhad. That was a really excellent depiction of how you're coming at uh, this work from different angles. Really, really helpful. Um, so as Biz said, I I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes. And while I'm talking, if you're a good multitasker, if you can just type your questions into the text box on the side of your screen. And then in about three or four minutes, we'll go into questions and answers. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Samantha Harvey. I'm an, a program officer at the Overbrook Foundation in New York City. And I'm also on the support team of a grassroots-led multi-sector initiative that Elizabeth mentioned called the Building Equity and Alignment for Impact Initiative, or the B initiative. And uh, I'm going to just talk really briefly about what B is and also how um, working with B has influenced some of our work at Overbrook. So, Overbrook is a small family foundation based in New York City, and we have an environment program and a human rights program. And most recently, we've been developing a movement building program that sort of sits at the confluence of those two um, in between. And uh, the, you know, we've heard this word intersectionality come up today. So the movement building program is working at the, the confluence of those two programs. Um, so silos and parameters are restrictions that many program officers are familiar with. And, one thing I've learned through the work uh, with the B initiative is that many frontline community groups, groups that are rooted in communities of color and white working class groups, are doing intersectional, radical systems changing work. You know, looking at health, education, gender, race, displacement, police brutality, some of the things that we've brought up today. Um, but because of this intersectional approach and the parameters that funders find themselves under, many groups on the front lines are right off the bat eliminated from foundation funding since funders tend to have strict silos around what we're able to fund. So Overbrook's attempt to stretch and break out of those restrictions was through the creation of a movement building portfolio that can really dig into work that might not otherwise fit. So this is one way that we're trying to make the most impact we can with limited resources and, and that work has been very influenced by the B initiative. Um, and it's still in development. So the B initiative, we can maybe go to the next slide. Thanks, Chris. Um, B initiative was launched by Overbrook in 2013, uh, primarily to figure out what it would take for the environmental movement to work better and more effectively together. And pretty quickly, we discovered that in order for that to happen, as a foundation, we needed to get out of the way. And we needed to look beyond just environmental issues, um, like Bernard was talking about earlier, um, look at uh, the people and the planet together, and we needed to launch the initiative but then deliberately take a step back. So acknowledging that a big issue crippling the movement was and continues to be a vast disparity of resources and access, and that the disparity falls pretty starkly along race and class lines, and acknowledging philanthropy's role historically in creating that disparity, we could not move further with B if we insisted on being at the helm. And it had to be grassroots led in order to work, to have a chance of working. So we convened a group of about 25 grassroots representatives uh, representing networks and community-based coalitions, about four philanthropic representatives and four representatives from what we called mainstream green groups. Um, and uh, 
we insisted on the grassroots leadership. We rooted our work uh, in the uh, Hemes principles of democratic organizing, and also the equation that you'll see in this little graph down below: um, equity plus alignment equals impact. So, meaning that we need political alignment and both financial and relational equity in order to have the greatest impact across the movement. So, it's not just about who has the resources; it is about that, but it's also about who's invited to the table, who's expected to represent whom and who is really guiding the work that is affecting the communities that we're talking about. And it should be, the work needs to be guided by the uh, communities that it's rooted in. So almost done, uh, these goals are to shift resources to the grassroots organizing sector, uh, to break down historic barriers between green groups, funders, and grassroots, and build equitable partnerships, and also to support funder culture to engage with a bottom-up community-based approach as opposed to a more traditional top-down approach. And we work toward these goals through a variety of work groups and projects. We have a research task force, we have a communications team, um, there's a group developing a pooled fund that will be administered by a grassroots advisory board, and we have a forum process for multi-sector political alignment. And through all of this work, we keep coming back to the HEMIS principles and the equity plus alignment equals impact equation. Um, so maybe let's go to the next slide. It's just the little, the B logo. Um, so I could talk about B for hours. We have about 15 minutes now for questions and answers, which is great. Um, we do have B, the B initiative has a grassroots-led leadership team that I'm happy to connect anyone uh, with afterwards. And I know that there are a few on the call right now. So if you want to email me, um, I'm happy to connect you with B's grassroots leaders and to answer any more questions. And I think just quickly before we jump into Q&A, I just want to say that it's easy as a funder, you know, once you sort of uh, learn about some of these issues. It's easy to kind of wallow in despair and feeling like um, feeling helpless or maybe even defensive about the work that we're doing because the truth is none of us would be here if we weren't good people trying to do good work for the planet and for our communities. Um, so what I have learned through B is that um, this isn't about me and it's not even about my organization. We're looking at his long historic trends, long historic trends of colonialism, of racism, of elitism, and um, these are extremely difficult and entangled systems to, to work on. So um, try to have a little compassion for yourself. Um, I've learned so much from my networks, as Farhad was talking about, sharing narratives, sharing stories. And um, in my opinion, probably many people on the call share this opinion. This is the best and most important work we can all be doing together today. So thank you so much for joining. Um, so let's jump to some questions. Uh, First question, um, how do, and I have this question for the panelists, how do you respond to the urgency argument when it comes to addressing racial justice in the environmental movement? So, you know, you hear sometimes, oh, that's great, and it's, um, it's really important to look at racial justice, but we only have a 10-year window, and, you know, the carbon fundament fundamentalist argument, how, how, do you, how do you respond to urgency when you're met with that? And anybody can answer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, th this is Elizabeth. Um, I think that we in our communities don't have a choice between choosing between racial justice and climate change. We have to do both. Uh, you know, our communities, I, I know that in Brooklyn we've had three tornadoes and we were hit by Sandy. Um, we're going to be impacted by all of those. Um, in terms of the urgency, you know, climate change means, in addition to displacement, it also means more policing um, with ex recurrent extreme weather events. There's going to be more policing. We know the Pentagon has been meeting to talk about how to deal uh, with these kinds of events and, and, and martial law. So we, we know that climate change is already here, and we also know that our population is growing by leaps and bounds. And by 2042, we will be the majority in the country. So we will be in the majority in the country at the very moment where it has fully taken hold of the United States. So so there is there is that urgency, and so we don't have time to start preparing for it, we need to start, we literally need to start doing it right now, and that's what we're doing in our communities. That's why uh, operationalizing just transitions is so important. The focus on carbon doesn't tell the whole story of what happens to an EJ community. In our communities, we're also dealing with co-pollutants with NOx, SOx, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, all of the things that are actually killing us and creating health disparities and have been for such a long time. So we have to work on all those fronts at the same time uh, because literally lives are at stake and it's not rhetoric, that, that, that's real. Mm -hmm. Somebody else have a response? Or we have a, a number of questions coming in that I could skip to. 
Uh, this is Farhad. I would just add that I think when folks talk about the argument for urgency, it's who gets to make the decisions urgently. If we're making decisions that affect Sunset Park and Elizabeth's community gets to make urgent decisions, that's very different than saying because of the urgency that somebody else from somewhere else gets to make those decisions. So I think part of it is it's not the urgency that's the problem. It's what the urgency suggests that we do differently. And if it suggests that we don't include the right folks in the decision making, then urgency is a problem. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question is more specifically for Renard. Uh, it says, um, uh, funding EJ grassroots organizations doing internal equity assessments. Okay, so oftentimes diverse organizations don't get funded because foundation boards are not diverse and inclusive themselves. Bernard, can you talk a little more about how ACE was able to do that internal assessment? And how did you get enough people on board in order to be able to do an assessment and stick to the goals you developed? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think uh, what really helped us, uh, first off, is listening to our field staff, the people who are closest on the ground, uh, working with students directly. Uh, from them, we learned that we needed to focus more on stories, the stories of the actual young people who were there uh, uh, facing challenges every day and listening to them. And as we listened to them and learned from them, it uh, gave us some more footing. And it allowed us to uh, do the work internally ourselves that our young people were bringing, uh, bringing up to us and also relaying those stories and that information to our board, to funders, and that's what helped us create and, and continue to build that commit, that uh, momentum to be the change ourselves. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth or Farhad, do you have anything you'd like to add from your own experience? Our, our organization is diverse. Oh, uh, you know, we're intergenerational. We have young people on our board of directors. Uh, we have young people on our staff. Uh, we really uh, com we're composed of of the ethnicities and races that exist in our community. A real talented staff. I think that we have to be intentional about making sure that decisions are being made from the ground. Um, and I think that you know, given given what we're facing, that that has to be a value, a core value that uh, the composition of our organizations really has to reflect you know, what we're hoping to do in our community. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, any suggestions for giving out smaller, less than $10,000 grants? Do you think these are worthwhile for climate justice organizations to apply for? And if so, how can we make the application process easier for them? Let me take the I'm sorry, as a, as a grassroots organization, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we can make, we have a whole, we have a history of stretching the dollar and doing a lot with a small amount. That's, that's always what we've done. The biggest challenge always is having to spend so much time trying to access the funds, um, reporting systems that are really complex and burdensome, that if funds like that are available, um, there has to be some trust or maybe even getting recommendations from other funders or looking at our outcomes of the things that we've accomplished as uh, as a way of assessing uh, rather than um, than asking for a lot of paperwork or reports or applying for a grant that is really cumbersome. Uh, every time that we spend hours doing that, those are hours that we are taking from doing the work on the ground. And many of us work you know, Saturdays and Sundays and evenings whenever our community is available. I think that um, working with the B would be really helpful. Uh, the B really has influenced a lot of funders on how to think differently about how how you should, you know, how you can support the grassroots um, and also with the Chorus Foundation. Um, there are other foundations that are now setting up processes that are a lot um, that are a lot sim simpler uh, for grassroots organizations to take advantage of. Renard or Farhad, you want to speak to that? I would say that, I mean, so, you know, we, Chorus makes fairly large commitments to specific organizations, but we also do a lot of grants that are, you know, 10K and less. 
Uh, and a lot of those, uh, this is sort of anecdotal, but I think end up being on the connective tissue as well. So there's, you, we, there will be small grants to small organizations, but also having a travel budget that folks can use so that they can go to convenings they want to go, they can visit other organizations that they want to connect with and learning from. Um, those are small grants, and those are small grants that often have, as Elizabeth was referring to, like just as much process as really big grants, which doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, I think also just a couple other things that can be done with smaller grants. Uh, you know, if you, if you focus on a specific place, you can you can put a smaller number of small grants to work in ways where you'll see your grants interacting with each other, which I think is really important. Um, and also having a grant making budget for organizing other funders. So when you're thinking about that connective tissue and how you might support uh, organizations to travel and, and, and visit each other or small convenings or things like that that can be relatively small grant sizes. Think about uh, projects that are engaging with funders in that way as well that are trying to move, uh, you know, you can make a small grant that leverages a much bigger funder than you to get somebody in the room to get them thinking differently where they might start making bigger grants than you can make but based on the, uh, the connections and the relationships that your small grant helped them develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I see we're running out of time, so I think I'm going to try to combine two questions. We'll see if I'm successful. <laughs> um, there was one question about the, the B fund that I mentioned, and um, also a question around movement building being a process. It takes time. Uh, for many funders, their trustees are looking for defined outcomes over discrete time frames, often one year. So what recommendations would you have for program officers caught between the desire to fund movement building and the insistence on short-term deliverables by trustees? Um, so I'm going to combine that very valid and present question with um, this question or, or an issue that a lot of larger funders have come to the B initiative with, which is we, we would love to fund the grassroots, but we don't have the capacity to fund multiple $10,000 grants, and we can't fund larger than a certain percentage of the grantee's budget. So how do we tackle these kinds of 12-month um, uh, deliverable uh, expectations and also um, not having the capacity to, um, to fund multiple small grants? So I'll just speak really quickly um, to the B Fund. Um, uh, Bill Gallegos, who's with uh, Communities for a Better Environment, and Melissa Lynn Perella, who's partnering with him from NRDC, are both B representatives working on developing that fund with uh, Grassroots International. It's still in the development phase, but um, we are working on having a pooled fund where larger foundations could put money into the fund, and then there would be a Grassroots Advisory Board to administer it. Um, that's in development now, and I connect, can connect you with uh, Bill or Melissa if, if you're interested um, in that. And then in terms of the the one-year time frames, I mean, that's a big challenge. Uh, I definitely don't want to have the last word here, so I'm going to open it up to the panel, but I think that um, from Overbrook's perspective, we have definitely done a lot of, had a lot of discussion with our board and trying to um, explain, uh, and, and we've had speakers come in to, the, to speak to the board about how community-based work is long-term. Systemic change doesn't happen overnight, so while, you know, it might be satisfying to say, oh, we wanted to plant this many trees and then a year later we planted them and that's great. You know, I know I'm, I'm simplifying, but if you're working on real systemic change and intersectional work, it's going to take more than a year and I think it's, it's the program officer's job to try to convince boards of that. Um, I don't know if uh, Bernard, Elizabeth Farhad, if you want to jump in on either of those questions because we have about one minute left. One thing that's been very helpful with my board, and I realize this isn't an option for everybody, but uh, not just bringing folks in to speak to the board at board meetings, but getting board members out in the field to spend time in communities, meet not just the EDs of these organizations, but meet the organizers, meet the members, meet the folks in the community that the organization is working with. I think that has done a tremendous amount uh, to get my board aligned around the level of work we're talking about, both the breadth and the depth and the amount of time it takes. So that's been very helpful for us in a variety of ways, not just uh, shifting sort of the time horizon. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would add uh, as well, this is Bernard, um, with what Farhad said in terms of the internal work that um, funders and boards can, can do, um, just really being able to, to take the time to uh, peel away some of the levels of privilege that you have at this point so that you can um, best ally with grassroots, with uh, the nonprofits that are here. When you're able to do that and be able to have a better understanding of that uncomfortable place uh, that 
people who historically have less privilege have, you're able to uh, think outside the box, be more helpful, and ally better. Uh, and so those are things that I would just encourage uh, boards and, and funders to do as well. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one more question? we got to wrap it up. Yeah, this is Viz from EPIP. I know some people may have to go, but there are a couple or maybe one more question lingering. So if you have to go, we understand that everything will be on the recording, and I will send that around. But for anyone who's able to stay for just a moment more, um, there's maybe one more question if you want to bring that to the panel, Samantha. Sure, sure. So uh, this is a question for Bernard. Can you share if there was a particular organization or consultant that assisted you with the internal equity assessment? Yeah, there are, thank you, uh, this is Bernard. There are a couple of things that helped us. Um, uh, one is the, uh, I have to honor the incredible work of uh, Jay Miyakota Taylor uh, with Fierce Allies. Um, uh, what she focuses on is being able to, uh, to, to teach everyone to, to talk in those uncomfortable spaces and to be safe, a safe and uncomfortable space to be able to do that work. Uh, the other thing that we utilize is uh, Race Forward has on their site, they have an, an, an let me look at the name of it, uh, an internal equity assessment. I can't remember the exact name of it uh, that's on their website. And we were able to use that to create our uh, our equity lens that I had mentioned before that will help us in each and every decision making that we make at ACE. So I would look at Race Forward site and also look at uh, Fierce Allies. And we've also utilized recently International Multicultural Institute as well. Yeah, um, I know um, I've also been I'm on the board of Center for Diversity in the Environment. They're also a group that a lot of funders have looked to. And then also, I would just say, look to the, the environmental justice groups in your own community. Um, you know, of course, be mindful about sucking time from their from their work, but um, it's important also to think about um, rooting the work in the place that you're in. And there's a lot of information online as well, yeah. Okay, uh, any last words from the panelists before we close it out? I would just say we've just scratched the surface, as you can tell. I wish we could do more Q&A with you all. Yeah. For anyone whose questions weren't answered or if you have follow-up questions, feel free to send them to me. This is biz at epip.org, and that way hopefully we can continue these conversations past this webinar. Um, I want to thank you guys. I don't know if you have closing words. I'll definitely make space for that. But I want to thank you for the time that you've put into bringing your presentations together. Um, thank you to everyone on the line as an attendee. This topic has been, you know, as we've seen with the attendance today, a really um, exciting one for people to get a chance to focus on. And I hope these intersectional conversations are ones we can continue to have um, together as members of coalitions and change-making movements, but also um, hopefully continued here through some of these networks as well. So thank you guys from EPIP very much. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Take care.